Seven years ago, Nick Molnar and Anthony Eisen were neighbours in Sydney. One day they got chatting, as good neighbours do, and came up with a simple idea that would ultimately outsmart voracious credit card companies and banks. Today, Nick and Anthony are not only business partners, they're billionaires. And that idea they had? Well, it's the financial phenomenon now called Afterpay, a revolutionary payment platform that's transforming the way people shop around the world. Anthony Eisen and Nick Molnar feel very much at home on Bondi Beach. It's where they come to relax and where they've spent time tossing around ideas, including the biggest of them all, Afterpay, a financial tech business that's made them Australia's newest billionaires. I'm going to say it, you're billionaires twice over. <laughs> what does that mean <laughs> to you? Not a whole lot. <laughs> you well, never thought that 12, would happen? 12 months ago, our stock price was $8 and we were far from, you know, the word that you use that we never use. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's just, you still feel on knife's edge. It doesn't, you know, it's, it, it almost sometimes doesn't feel real. Yeah, it's, it's not our skin, if I can put it that way. Nick and Anthony came up with a simple yet revolutionary plan to reinvent the shopper's friend, lay-by. Fundamentally, what we wanted to do was turn a traditional model on its head. It's been snapped up worldwide, mostly by millennials, the 25 to 40 year olds, and turned Afterpay into a company currently worth more than $25 billion. But what is extraordinary about this success story is that it might never have occurred if it weren't for the fact that Nick Molnar and Anthony Eisen were neighbours. Did you know Nick? I didn't know him, um, but um, in my regular job of putting out the rubbish, you know, you get to meet the neighbours sometimes. Of course, Nick didn't put out the rubbish. <laughs> it, was, it was his father. So, you know, from across the road, we started a conversation. And um, within a little bit of time, uh, the conversation went, well, you need to speak to my son, Nick. With an age difference of 18 years, Nick 31 and Anthony 49, they might seem an unlikely pair. The age gap is a plus. It seems. What are you talking about? <laughs> but in fact, they've proven to be a perfect match. Anthony is an accountant turned investment banker, and Nick was the kid with plenty of bright business ideas. Nick, why do I read about a black market sushi business? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I'd call it black market. I guess it was totally black market. Um, <laughs> uh, look, as a, from a young age, I, you know, always pushed the boundaries of being an entrepreneur. Uh, I would, you know, go to the sushi restaurant uh, the day before and buy all their excess stock. It was totally off. Like, <laughs> but people loved to buy my sushi at school the next day. So there was always, you know, the little hustle that was going on. Um, and then it moved into jewellery. And it moved into jewellery. And that was very yeah. successful. Yeah. Well, my, my parents were in jewellery from the moment I was born. But, you know, my mum pretty early on was like, hey, Nick, there's this online thing. It's starting to, to take off. Like, you should, you should sell jewellery online. And one thing led to another. And, you know, before I knew it, I sold the most jewellery on eBay out of my bedroom while at university. And you're watching uh, something odd going on next door. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the light was on every night. I saw shadows moving around and then lots of boxes with little packages in the morning getting run up to the post office. And actually, I thought there was a whole lot of not very good things going on next door. But it all changed when Nick sought out his neighbour for career advice. Talk of professions evolved into a plan an audacious one. What in the world is happening on Wall Street? Do you know you? Having watched the impact of the global financial crisis, they decided to take on 
the traditional credit card industry. It's been completely wiped out. I just turned 18 and the message was don't spend money you don't have and we saw that lay-by was hugely present in the Australian retail economy. Like many businesses had 10% of their total transaction volume was product that had to sit in a cupboard where people came and slowly paid it back on time and if they didn't pay it off then this stock now which is well out of fashion is now back on the shelf and can't be sold. So we just saw that there was this opportunity yeah. to bring the two trends together. How long did it take for you both to realise, yeah, this is a good idea? <laughs> yeah. When, uh, when, a, when a trickle turned to a flood, I think, <laughs> is, is the answer, and it happened pretty quickly. And um, I was like, I think that's really good. <laughs> this is terrific. People are liking this. And um, I turned to Nick and said, well, look, this is, this is uh, all our own money here. Um, <laughs> a customer's going to pay us back. It was an extraordinary gamble. How it works is that customers can buy goods to the value of $2,000, take them home immediately by agreeing to pay for them in four equal instalments. Unlike traditional credit cards, there are no annual fees and no nasty interest rate charges. But if you miss a payment with Afterpay, you'll cop a late fee and your account will be blocked. Just open the app. Afterpay makes its money by charging retailers a commission for its service that can't be added to the customer's bill. Done. It's great. How many times have you done this for your wife? How many times has she done it for herself? That's the question. <laughs> so far, nearly 15 million shoppers and 86,000 retailers in nine countries around the world have embraced the brand. It is an extraordinary story, isn't it? Yeah. A couple of neighbours come together and with a good idea. A good idea that they got behind and and sold literally to the world. Um, you know, it's what capitalism's supposed to be built on. People with a new idea, a new product, they risk their own capital and literally sell to the world. Uh, the fact that so many people are, are pursuing it, the fact that so many people are leaving credit cards behind and using Afterpay uh, is literally proof that it's a good idea. Economist Richard Dennis says Afterpay's success has been remarkable and what's more has caught the old school off guard. It's almost too good to be true. <laughs> Look, it is. That's right. For, for the consumer, no fees and no interest if you pay on time. Uh, compared to what the banks will charge you on credit cards, that's a great deal. And that's why it's such a threat to, to the big banks and to the credit card companies themselves. It's been compelling to watch. Afterpay listed on the Australian Stock Exchange in 2016. Quickly becoming one of the top 20 companies. Are you convinced that having Afterpay on the window as a lure brings them in? Forget the window. I put it on a bus. Haven't you seen my buses? We've got buses everywhere, Liz. Justin Levis, the CEO of Australian fashion house Q, was one of the first to give Afterpay a go and saw instant results. The fact is, it is the biggest payment platform and it's working for our business. Thousands of Australian retailers signed up. And very soon after, the business went global. Taking off in America when the Kardashians introduced Afterpay as a payment option for their customers. Oh my God, and it matches my outfit. It's just so much fun. How did that happen? They filled out our contact form. I tried every single angle possible to get through to them and their businesses with failure and then just the moment the stars aligned and they came, they came inbound. And then I'm sitting out for lunch with my wife and she starts whacking me. She's like, Nick, Nick, you won't believe it. Kim just Instagrammed about Afterpay. Because at two weeks we yeah. had to answer questions like, how much did you pay for that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't, and it was purely organic. 
But this stratospheric ride has not come without some uncomfortable bumps, particularly when the booming buy now, pay later industry caught the attention of the Australian government. You said, Nick, that um, being a professional athlete uh, is not dissimilar to being an entrepreneur, yeah. uh, in that you get a punch in the face every day. Yeah. <laughs> is that true? It's completely true. It's still true. I mean, the, Do you get a punch in the face every day? I think day? the resilience you need to be an entrepreneur, it's, it's incredibly intense. <laughs> I bet you're the last person people expect to find driving them around. Well, you know what, um, I don't come out straight away and say, hey, you know, <laughs> I'm Nick Molnar's dad. There but, could be uh, no prouder father than part-time Uber driver Ron Molnar, who's watched his son Nick, the co-founder of financial tech company Afterpay, turn a brainwave into a multi-billion dollar business. I used to love getting the retailers in my car because then I'd say, yeah, do you have Afterpay? And if they said no, I was like the salesman for Afterpay. <laughs> so I'm the market research guy. You are. Yeah. Ron is no business slouch either. For more than 30 years, he owned a jewellery store. But since retiring, he's become Afterpay's secret weapon. Look, you know, if I got someone who was, who was older, yeah, then more often than not, they didn't know what Afterpay was anyway. You mean people like us? People like us. <laughs> Lizzie, I wasn't going to say that. I actually wasn't going to say that, but <laughs> yes, Liz, people like us. People like us. People like us. But did you get people like us over the line? Yeah, I think I did. I haven't played this for a while. You can tell. <laughs> Inside the Sydney headquarters of Afterpay, the mood is high. Co-founders Nick Molnar and Anthony Eisen are enjoying their little used office toys. Hey, Nick. <laughs> this is a partnership that warms a father's heart, a serendipitous neighbourhood connection that was partly Ron's doing. There's two factors here that I think are huge. Number one, that, that um, Anthony's wife talked him into buying that house. <laughs> and number two, that my wife put enormous pressure on me to buy our house because if that, if that hadn't happened, this doesn't happen. <laughs> that neighbourhood bond that Nick and Anthony share has helped them ride the highs and lows of building a big business, including fronting a Senate inquiry into the unregulated buy now, pay later industry. The maximum amount a customer can have owing is $2,000. With some critics claiming it's offering just another credit card service. It's impossible for Afterpay to bankrupt a person, for example, and we've never enforced a debt. Um, so we don't see ourselves as the straw that breaks the camel's back. It looks a bit like a credit company, it smells a bit like a credit company, but it's not. Traditional credit works on people being in debt, staying in debt, and paying interest. And in fact, those models only work if customers don't pay back straight away. Our whole proposition is that customers cannot fall into a debt trap. So if you miss a single payment with Afterpay, you can't use the service to make another purchase. You know, our average transaction value across 15 million customers today is about $150. Customers are never in a position where they've got thousands of dollars of debt outstanding. So you're not resisting regulation? We're not resisting regulation. Our new industry should be regulated, but it shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all approach. Oh, look, all industries are regulated, but not everyone needs the same regulation. Economist Richard Dennis agrees Afterpay should be viewed differently to the credit card industry because he says it makes its money in a fundamentally different way. 
Of course there are risks with people spending money they don't have. Um, that's true whether it's a credit card, whether it's afterpay, whether it's 60 month interest free advertised on telly for a retailer. There's all sorts of problems with credit risk in Australia and around the world. Uh, but afterpay have come up with a model that, that, that caps fees and doesn't charge punitive interest uh, in ways that I think protect consumers better than, than the credit card companies and the banks have. Hey Josh, how are you going? Nick, it's amazing to see you. On the world stage, Afterpay is a financial tech superstar. Nick and Anthony continue to take calls from major brands, today from shoe company Steve Madden in America. Afterpay as an app, we're seeing as a great acquisition tool. So but it's also staying close to its first customers, those in the Australian fashion trade. Afterpay's uh, Future of Fashion Runway will showcase uh, many of uh, the incredible designers that are in the room today. Afterpay uh, is sponsoring Australian Fashion Week, an important nod to an industry that backed them from the beginning, giving flight to an idea that stormed the retail world. In five years, where would you like to be? Well, we actually tried as a leadership team to write to a five-year plan. <laughs> And we ended up with a two-year sprint. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're now competing with the biggest companies in the world. Um, they've recognised what we do and how special it is. Perhaps only on Bondi Beach can a couple of local billionaires go unnoticed. But in the business world, Anthony Eisen and Nick Molnar are hard to miss. They dared to try something new and are now surfing a massive afterpay wave, one they created and had the ticker to ride. To a young entrepreneur in the making, right here in Australia, uh, but, but what's the message? Well, my advice would be to find an Anthony Eisen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like think... you've got to share it with someone. It's really difficult to be a lone soldier in this. If I go back to where we started, you know, you can do finance, you can do retail, you can make toast in the morning and turn off the lights. You know, <laughs> we shared all of that. We built IKEA furniture for our first office, you know. Um, um, the age difference and the experience difference is what gives us our strength, I think. How do you sum up this marriage? It's definitely a marriage. Uh, yeah, I speak to Anthony first thing in the morning. I speak to Ant before I go to sleep. You know, we talk a lot about being grounded in reality, about being humble. Let's not drink our own Kool-Aid. Let's face into the good, face into the ugly, and ask ourselves the hard questions. And I think that fundamental you know, relationship has been so critical from the start. Yeah. I just really like him. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't use the word love, buddy. Uh, <laughs> Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes another exclusive 60 Minutes content.